Uh, good evening to everybody and thanks a lot for uh, coming in today and thank you sir Mr. Gopal Krishnan for uh, you know, accepting our invitation to come and speak today. Uh, I'll spend the next few minutes talking about business clinic. Uh, this is basically business clinic as I explained a little bit earlier. This is a uh, uh, basically, uh, planning for business growth, enabling and developing employees, and finding solutions and challenges. This is what we are doing. It's just about five-month-old uh, initiative. Yeah. Uh, our value proposition is to give timely, effective, and affordable advice to uh, uh, the MSMEs and large organizations. Also, and it's been quite an interesting journey so far. Yeah. The founders are that's me on the top. Then there's Ram Kumar and my younger son Anush who also runs a restaurant in, uh, called Meze in Chennai. Uh, Ram has, has got over 20 years of experience. He graduated from ISB Hyderabad and uh, he actually runs the whole show and I, I support him. That's what we do. Yeah. Uh, our, our basic offerings are on three planes or three pieces as we would call it. One is plan to win. We, we help uh, organizations you know, put together a nice business planning uh, document called the business planning workshop. Then we have leadership development coaching because <clears throat> like Jaram, me, Chand, Atul, all of us are CFI certified coaches. So we help organizations in the leadership coaching and executive coaching. And then we have prime solutions, which is the bulk of the uh, <coughs> jobs, what we do right now. We provide solutions to various challenges which are faced by companies. Well, this is explaining the whole thing. Plan to win is basically business planning workshops alignment on the way forward. Basically what happens is the leader wants something to happen, the team lags behind. So we get the team together and make the uh, business planning workshop for a couple of days. Now we are doing it online. So we help them align to the company's goals. And first of all, we help uh, MSMEs uh, write down a vision, a workshop, and you know, that helps them. Yeah. Persevere to lead again is the uh, leadership programs, what we do both on one-to-one -one and also team coaching clear alignment for the individual and, for, and with the organization goals. <coughs> Prime solutions, the way it works is, uh, I mean, uh, any any company who's got a challenge, post the details in our site, and then we, we look at the 25 odd advisors we have, try and match who can solve the problem or, you know, at least provide good solutions for that. And then after a little bit of uh, e email exchanges and clarifications, we do a consultation session, which again is on Zoom, which lasts for about two hours plus. We try and offer the, the company, uh, you know, good action points, which they can work on. And they come back to us for a review, maybe a month or two later, and we again help them in various follow-up points. The, the extension of that is a new program what you launch, which is called the Export Insights Program, which currently, which is happening right now, also one program at Indian Oil, uh, where, you know, what we do is, you know, we, our, our experts are good in many areas, outstanding uh, knowledge and insights they have. What you're seeing is we would help them, help the organizations provide the insights, what they know on that subject. It could be supply chain. Today, what's happening at Indian Oil is on business analytics. That's a subject which is, uh, you know, so hard today. So we are helping the entire front uh, field force to understand the uh, nuances of business analytics and helping the team do some uh, practical work on this area. So this we are, you know, we want to extend this to various other fields also in the near future. Areas in which were in entry and growth strategy, new look at R&D and innovation. We talked about Dr. Subramaniam who runs uh, uh, an outsourced R&D and innovation company where, com where uh, companies go to him and he can help sort out the problems and supply chain managing, you know, all these are all the various areas where we can do the uh, uh, help in. And then some challenges we helped solve, you know, chemical manufacturing company wanted to increase their business. So we helped them re-strategize and re -understand, you know, understand the businesses better and look at new markets. Uh, Manpower recruitment agency, you know, they were uh, largely uh, you know, supplying to a lot of blue colored blue colored workmen to uh, Singapore. That business suddenly dried up. So then what he had to do was he had to rediscover himself and find some large business opportunities in India. So we are helping him reframe his business. Consumer product company wanted to launch a product here. So we went and did some market research and helped them put down a marketing and distribution strategy. And a chemical comp manufacturing company wanted to understand, redefine their <coughs> supply chain. They were having very high inventory levels. So we were able to uh, help them 
you know, tide over uh, some of the problems what they have and suggest to them uh, some uh, areas where which is glaringly visible to us and are to our advisors. Yeah. These are all our advisors. I think most of them are here today. And you know, I think this is a great strength we have. And uh, these are all the old acquaintances. The big thing we bring about in business clinic is we know the client well and we know our advisors well. So it is not uh, just a simple computer uh, doing a mix and match. I think they understand the problems and personalize it to a large extent what we can do. Yeah. So in addition to this, what we also do is we thought <clears throat> just uh, doing business is uh, not a great uh, thing, but we should also do something, give something back to the society. We do two events in a month. One is on the 15th <coughs> of the month. Like uh, we have uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan today speaking. For the last five months, we had every 15th, one dignitary coming and talking to us and invite everybody. It's a complimentary webinar. And on the 30th, we have what introduced what is called as a power mentoring. We get two of our advisors on board. We invite people to come and ask questions in the area where they are good at. And people come in and ask. And we have two Zoom rooms, two separate rooms, where people come and interact with them, ask the about the problems and we're able to help them. At, like, these are some of the things. And this is the uh, uh, 30th October, we are going to have uh, a power mentoring session where, you know, Dr. Srikanth is going to be here and Subir Mazumdar is going to be talking about supply chain. He's going to be mentoring on this. And Disruptor 10, Dr. Srikanth again is uh, the MD of uh, Keretsu Forum and he's an expert in this area. So with this, I think I request Ram to introduce uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan <coughs> and uh, take it forward. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, for uh, agreeing to do this uh, session for us. Uh, we are really looking forward to the session. Uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, like, there's this cliche, doesn't need any introduction, and he really fits the uh, thing. So he's a prolific author. I think we have read many of his books, some of which are actually, uh, which you can see on the screen there. Uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan is very well known as an author and corporate advisor. Uh, and for businesses that look at metrics and numbers, he has 53 years of management experience, of which 32 years uh, are in boards of different companies. He, he has done over 100 keynotes in India and abroad. He's authored 16 books and numerous new newspaper articles and he is also very well known as a management writer. Um, he's uh, been a professional manager since the year 1967. He served as a chairman of Unilever Arabia, as the managing director of Group Pond Lipton, as vice chairman of Hindustan Lever, and as director of Tata Sons and several Tata companies. And uh, he currently serves as an independent director and non-executive chairman of Castrol India, and also as an independent director of Hemas Holding PLC in Sri Lanka. And uh, he, uh, he gives back so much to the society. There's so much uh, that he, uh, that people learn from him actively in all the sessions that he conducts. So he's very much engaged in both instructional as well as inspirational speaking. So currently, uh, as he says, he spends his time writing, advising, speaking, and teaching. So we saw some of the books that he has written. He's also written a lot of articles. Uh, he advises a lot of companies. Uh, he speaks in many forums and, uh, 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 Mr. Gopalakrishnan also teaches. So he serves as an executive in residence at SPJ Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai. And he's a distinguished professor at IIT, Karakpur. Uh, in terms of education, he studied physics at St. Xavier's, Kolkata, engineering at IIT, Karakpur, and then uh, did the advanced management program at Harvard Business School. Uh, he's a past president of All India Management Association. And uh, he has a wide repertoire of subjects you know, on which he speaks, and he has uh, experience and wisdom to share. Uh, and his list of accomplishments is just like really, really long. So, uh, uh, and a lot of books that he has written. So without uh, any further delay, I uh, welcome Mr. Gopalakshan and thank him once again for uh, uh, agreeing to do this session for us. We are really looking forward to the session, sir. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ram Kumar, for that introduction. Uh, I love to listen to people introducing me because it gives the impression that I'm a very accomplished guy. And once in a while, it does good to your ego to think that somebody says so. But the truth of the matter is, uh, I'm also a pilgrim like you on the road, trying to learn. Maybe I'm on age or number of years service, one or two steps uh, ahead of some of you. And uh, maybe I've seen one or two signs on the road which uh, you haven't seen. 
Uh, I therefore come into this uh, uh, without any pretensions to wisdom, but uh, just an experience sharing as a fellow pilgrim on this tortuous path of uncertainty. Uh, when I was requested by Mr. Rajshekharan to address this group, I, you know, being a consumer background guy, I said, uh, what does the customer want? And I suspect that the lady's name is uh, Ambuja? Uh, Ambika. 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 Sorry. Ambika. I, sorry, Ambika, I've forgotten your name. But no having got a market research uh, person amidst them, she, they promptly produced an MR report for me. Uh, and therefore, I have used that as the basis of uh, my preparation. Except that instead of all the 10 or 12 questions uh, to which uh, they want all the answers within half an hour or 45 minutes, I have clubbed them together. Uh, and therefore, it's a good consumer product in the sense it's been researched with the consumer and uh, I've tried to provide some answers. If uh, my remarks are on target and uh, customers like it, then I will get the credit. If it's off target, then the market research is wrong. So let's get the <laughs> landscape quite clear amongst us. Uh, business clinic has failed to produce the customer's voice to me properly. Uh, so I first combined three or four, or two or three of the three questions, I think, which goes somewhat like this as I have reconstructed it. Uh, how can companies truthfully introspect? How can companies truthfully introspect on the current experiences, become positive and aggressive in business? And how should a CEO be in this VUCA environment? So that's one cluster of questions. And I'm putting them together. And I want to reflect on this question in two parts. One is, uh, is VUCA new? I want to challenge it. And the second question that I want to ask is, how should a leader lead? Whether it's new or old, it is new to that leader. Because it might have happened in two centuries ago. It's like saying 1918 pandemic is there, we can learn lessons from it. But nobody who's alive today and facing uh, COVID-19 can remember what happened in that. So first thing I want to dispel is that this word VUCA, which as you know, has been coined by the uh, US War College, I think, in 2002, when uh, President Bush told them, you know, the whole world is turning upside down. Uh, can you go and deliberate on it? And they came back with this word VUCA standing for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So now it's become a buzzword. No management uh, professor or uh, consultant uh, can speak for more than half an hour without uttering the word VUCA. It's like OM or Shanti, you know, in a Vedic uh, context. Uh, but I am of the view that VUCA is not new at all. It's a new buzzword, yes. And I want to therefore make a suggestion to participants in this uh, and MSMEs in particular who feel a bit lonely in this vast jungle that uh, believe in yourself. This situation has happened several times in the past. No two situations are identical. But believe in yourself. And uh, Ref reflect and think about your own experiences, learn from other people as you're trying to do, I suppose. Every generation, now that I'm the age that I am, thinks that it is facing very unique challenges, uh, which are never before been challenged. And then there are Silicon Valley gurus who will give speeches on this, then we will get a YouTube version of it and circulate it, which we are convincing ourselves that the greatest tumultuous commotion of the universe is happening right here. And uh, I suppose there are some elements of truth in it, but there are large elements of untruth in it. I don't want to go back too much into history, but I have a very nice book. Uh, my companion now, apart from my wife, is the books that I have. And the book says, it is called Centuries of Change. It's written by a historian in uh, Leeds or somewhere in the UK. And he has taken 10 centuries where some data, historical data is available, 1000 to 1099, 1100 to 1199, 
coming right up to 1901 to 1999. Uh, it's a very academically written book, it's obviously a scholarly book. But he has taken 100 year gaps, 10 of them, and said which century saw the largest amount of change. And if you ask this question to many people, they would say, well, obviously, the last century. And uh, more so in the 21st century, which is not a part of the book. But he has given several examples to demonstrate that uh, it depends on how you look at what has changed. If it's health, it may be one. If it is war, it may be another. If it is uh, advancement of science, it may be a third, and so on and so forth. And so what is changing depends on how you look at it also. Just to give you one or two examples, it's difficult for us to imagine that just 400 years ago, uh, it is a miserable time to live in Europe. Absolutely miserable. The average age mortality was 27 years to 30 years. Right? At that age, you were old and dead. Um, they had civil war. Uh, Italy and uh, warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed. It was Bihar raised to the power two. I hope there are no Biharis here. Chand, I hope you're not from Bihar, but don't take offense if I make a passing reference to uh, one of our states. Uh, then you take the transmission of information because everybody says, ah, we are now in the information age. In the 1600s, uh, it was all by horseback. And uh, in the French Revolution came, uh, new newspapers came, carriages came. I've, con I've considered some of these because one of my uh, interests has been to trace my family history to a small village in Tajau, uh, which I used to visit when my grandfather was alive. And like most of us, uh, since grandfather moved on, everybody had come to the city. And I've traced my family back to 1823. And that I wrote it up uh, for my grandchildren. So I have a 200 year history that I have written. And then hopefully my grandson or great grandson will write another 200 years. So we'll have 400 years. It's not so much about my family as uh, the transition, the social change, which caused a family to make changes, to change. And when I published the book, because the publisher showed interest in it, I was really surprised that I got lesser emails or letters from somebody in Punjab, somebody in Bengal, of course, a few people in Tamil Nadu, saying, you know, if you change the names, this is exactly the story of my family. Because these are all PLUs, people like us. I don't think most of us had ancestors who were farmers or priests. And uh, there's nothing right or wrong about it. That's a reality. <laughs> and in that book, I have traced how, for example, my great-grandfather got news about uh, what we call 1857. Uh, the first war of independence, if you use Savarkar's terminology, or uh, the first Indian mutiny, if you use the British terminology. And by the way, I have not concocted these. I have not imagined them. I had little snippets when my grandfather was alive, and I used to record these and write it down. I had no tape recorder, so I got little notes. Of course, I then went to history books and started to check. And uh, uh, I have therefore, in a sense, allowed myself to experience the changes that I'm talking about. And uh, I don't want to go on and on about it, except to say that please don't think that VUCA is something new. The terminology is new. Don't get put off. It's Gargar ki kahani, Rod Roj ka cover. And uh, anybody who tries to tell you that we are going through unprecedented times is trying to sell you a piece of software or a, a new digital device, that's for sure. Uh, now, having said this, does it mean that uh, we just let things develop as they come and that we don't have to bother? That's also not true. I don't think one should uh, uh, assume. So you have to be alert. Like your grandfather was alert, like your grandfather's grandfather was alert. You know, in my book, I have written how my grandfather was a little boy and he was taken to a railway station called Mandaruli, where his father showed him. He said, you know, this gadget, this monster which is huffing and puffing can reach Madras 
in uh, nine hours or ten hours instead of our going on the bullock cart. This is eighteen hundred and something. And uh, he told him, "What has Kali Yugam come to? You know, <laughs> this is this is the way." Uh, uh, I don't know how you people are going to manage. So my grandfather used to tell my father, I don't know how you people will manage. And my father told me and I told my son and my son is starting to tell his growing up, my grandson. So now having described the fact that Buka is a permanent feature, it's like oxygen in the air or water in the river. It doesn't mean that you can assume that the river will never go into speed or that the oxygen in the air will not be polluted. So the question arises, what should the CEO do? And this applies whether the CEO of uh, Tata, ITC, Hindustan Lever, or an MSME or a startup. I think one of the biggest failures of CEOs, now I can say, it's been my failure, by the way. I'm not pointing fingers at other people. When I think back, I'm now at an age and stage when it's possible to think back at what all one day. Uh, is to underestimate the importance of vaccinating your company. You know, we are in COVID times, so I must use it. I'm using a terminology for vaccination because uh, we all want to be protected from some invisible, uh, invisible, uh, invisible uh, assailants. And that's what vaccination is all about. Who is vaccinating the company? Because every company is smart enough or got enough smart people who can look at the visible assailants of the company. Who are the competitors? What is the government regulation? Um, what are the pricing like? What are the technologies being used? These are what I call explicit knowledge, which you can collect. It is a tacit knowledge which is difficult to collect. And that is about how do your distributors feel? How do your employees feel? What is that feeling worth? How does it translate into the way they react? What is their motivation? And I use the metaphor of vaccination to say that people power is a COVID-20 vaccine, which I have invented. <laughs> I'm just being a bit facetious. Uh, and it's been tested. It's gone through phase three trials. And I'm recommending it to every uh, person who's actively, as they say that, uh, you know, experience is like a comb to a bald man. It is uh, useless when you get it. So I am trying to share it. I am trying to share my comb with you because I, it's not a much good at this stage of my life. So we have in our body, uh, anybody with a nodding acquaintance of uh, physiology will know this. We have in our body uh, three layers of immunization, three layers of protection. One is the physical layer, the outside layer, which is uh, your skin, for example. And the skin prevents uh, outward objects penetrating your body. And uh, in, there is an equivalent of that, which is the employees of the company. The employees of the company are the skin of the company. <clears throat> Their being solid as a protection and a covering is very important. The second layer in your human physiology that protects you is... Uh, uh, what is called uh, your innate system. That is, it is, it, it is your natural system, your DNA, your ancestors. So, your grandfather had diabetes, your father had diabetes, you're prone to diabetes because that's your innate system. Uh, heart attacks, you know, these things are all, can be transmitted. I don't know which all are the diseases, but at least two come to my mind. And so, uh, depending on your industry, your company, uh, its history, you may be prone to certain diseases. And then comes the adaptive layer. So you have a physical layer, an innate layer, and an adaptive layer. And the adaptive layer is the most important because enemies or assailants that have got through the physical layer, that have got through the uh, innate layer, have, the body has to adapt to them. And that's where the antibodies are generated and so on and so forth. So if I take this equivalent and apply it to a company, the employees and their general morale and motivation is the physical layer. The second layer, which is the innate layer, is what I call the culture of the company. Every company has a culture. 
even startups have a culture. It is not something that you can leave for later. And uh, the third layer is what happens when the attack happens. You know, so you generate antibodies. For example, uh, if somebody attacks uh, Tata's and I, along with five Tata people, are sitting and listening to this, will I speak up and fight for Tata's? Especially if the information being peddled is wrong. You know, if it's, if it's right information, you may be generous enough to say that's fine. Uh, or ITC or HUL or whatever. Uh, do people recommend it? You know, I, when I was younger, I would, I had, like many other people, an ambition to join the IAS. But then my father sent me to some senior I, IAS officers who said, Arey, don't come and get mixed up with IAS. You're getting a job in Hindustan, you better go there. I mean, they gave me the advice in good faith. But it's nice to be able to say, you, if you get a job in Hindustan Lever or ITC or Glaxo, great company, do join. Uh, that's a nice recommendatory thing that can happen. So that's the, what I mean by the adaptive layer. And I tried to convert all this into what does the CEO do? And like all mantras, once you know the mantra, you say, what's so great about it? Who doesn't know this? But if I tell you it's the Brahma mantra, repeat it every morning. Some of you may think, well, I've learned it by heart. Why not? I do it. And there are six that I have written down based on my experience. The first is reward employees. Reward doesn't mean having stock option scheme. Reward them emotionally, financially, I'm assuming. Uh, reward them to make them feel wanted. Second, provide meaningful feedback. Too many of us, I have certainly guilty of this, have probably grown up saying, well, I don't want to be difficult about it. Can you say the truth without hurting? That's a skill you have to learn in feedback. The third is respect employees. Especially in MSMEs, I shouldn't say especially because I don't want to single them out. Very often we feel so overwhelmed and busy. It happens in families. Why talk of companies? People are so busy with their gadgets and with the need to complete things. You fail to respect. How often has your wife told you, I am not objecting to what you told me, but I am objecting to the way you told me that. <laughs> you know, when you are discussing your child's education or marriage or whatever is the subject. Uh, the fourth is train and support employees. This is not the HR department's job. It's a CEO's job. In fact, uh, in my association with SP Jain, I have authored six books. Because we sat down and asked ourselves, who are the great institutions of India, business institutions, which have come up in the last 30 years. So we don't take the ITCs and the Hindustan Levers and the Tata Steels, which are 150 years old, because we want to talk to the founder. And we define institution in a particular way. And it was it's so difficult. We could with great difficulty find seven or eight companies where all of us were agreed that these are institutions in the making. Uh, three of the books are out in the market. One is on how TCS built a software industry for India. One is on Anil Nayak in Larson and Tumro. And the third one is Biocon, how they fermented Biocon. Three more books are due, which will come post lockdown, hopefully in February. Called One is on HDFC Group, Deepak Parekh. One is on Uday Kotak, which is on Kotak Bank. And one is Harsh Mariwala. On, uh, on uh, Marico. Uh, I'm mentioning these because uh, you will probably learn the same lessons out of uh, looking at ITC or Tata Steel or things that are 100 years old. But it's nice to know that it's happening currently and this is not some uh, biblical fable that's happening. Uh, be emotionally generous and instill pride in the team. So I've got those six mantras which uh, I believe are as simple as uh, the sun rising in the east every day, but which are forgotten in every company that I have visited. Reward employees, provide meaningful feedback, respect employees, train and support employees, be emotionally generous and instill pride in the team. Those are the six that I have thought of. One could argue whether those are the right six, but I would not pick up that argument. 
I have had some association with startups. I advised three or four startups. I have uh, consulted with some medium-sized companies. And usually, it's not their strategy that is wrong. It's not their ambition that is wrong. There may be flaws in it which you can improve. But it isn't these. And these are all left to the HR department. They say, okay, bhai, vice president, they know. That's not the solution. Uh, I wanted to convert this into little stories. And for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to just cover three stories. Again, to make it catchy. My background is in marketing, so I may be forgiven if I make it catchy. I call it the three C's. If you can't remember these six items, convert it into three C's, which I call connection, conversation, and contemplation. So what do I mean by connection? Um, you know, you have to be connected with your people. Uh, like many of you, I have also traveled a lot during my career. And one of the countries where I visited South Africa, I was very interested in how the Zulu tribe has integrated with society. And they told me that, I think it's a Zulu language, but I'm not terribly sure whether I'm stating it correctly. Uh, when a person meets another person, he says, Sao Bona. And the reply is, Sikona. It is like you go to the Middle East, you say, Salam Alaikum, you say, Wa Alaikum As Salam. Where I leave. <laughs> so there's this Sao Bona and Sikona. So, being a little interested in linguistics, I said, well, what exactly does that mean? And to my great surprise, Sao Bona means, I see you, are you there? And Sikona means, yes, I am here. So I said, that's a very funny thing. People meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning, saying Sao Bona and Sikona. What do you mean, are you there? You're right there in front of me. They said, no. And now I don't know if this interpretation is right, but it's very romanticized way of thinking about it. He says, before electricity, we were all in the bushes. So when you heard a rustle somewhere, you didn't know if it's an animal, a predator, or your tribesman. So he says, Sao Bona. And if you got the reply, Sikona, you knew that it's your uh, tribesman. Uh, if you got, then you knew it's a lion. You know? So... Uh, it sounds very cute and nice. How many of us walk into our office every day saying Sao Bona to the guy you meet in the lift? And he replies, Sikona. Usually, the higher you are, the more growly you are. And the more... Uh, and I have been guilty as much of this as anybody else. So I'm not finding fault with other people. And somehow, we are trained to think that leaders should be very workmanlike and should not connect with people. Uh, so that's the first one I wanted to say is to be connected. The second one I said I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, conversation. Uh, we somehow think that if I listen to the other guy, it's good enough. So if I'm the, I don't know, CFO, I will call people, say the budget is coming, what are the key points, some assistant will be taking notes. I've done this, so I don't see why any of you wouldn't have done it. Uh, when you're the finance minister of the country, you'll have this big tamasha in North Block where people will come and they'll make their suggestions on how to reduce excise duty or sales tax or whatever. You go through the motions. You're not really engaged. The number of CEOs who are not really engaged in a conversation with their employees is just stunning. And uh, I'm not blaming other CEOs. I can think of occasions when I have been guilty of that. So... It's good to admit it uh, before it's too late. And I think it's a very important thing that all the standard fun and frolic and great place to work and all the economic time stuff is all, you know, fun and games. The real way people feel engaged is when they think that you're listening to them. I remember when I went to Goodborn Lipton, when I came back from Saudi Arabia as the managing director of Goodborn Lipton back in the mid-90s, Goodborn Lipton was a very uh, it had its own complications. Brookbond was a 100-year company. Lipton was a 100-year company. And these two had got married. They were doing their Satavishayam uh, um, or whatever you want to call it. But they had seven little new babies. So the nine companies were put into that one company. It was called Brookbond Lipton India Limited. It had Brookbond, it had Lipton, who had grown up as absolute enemies of each other, taking market share from each other. And they had bought uh, uh, 
four quality walls companies, Kisan tomato ketchup company. Uh, they had bought Dumduma tea estate. They had bought tea estates India Limited. And all these were being merged and trying to be culturally harmonized. And uh, the only solution I could find, I mean, the HR department ran many good programs to their credit. The only thing I could do was to sit and listen and not judge the genuine worries. So if there's a Lipton ASM in Bihar and there's a Brookbond ASM, each one felt the other guy will get the better of it. And any of us who's been in a company knows that this happens all the time. So you sit and listen rather than... Uh, and the last one I want to mention, I said connectedness and conversation is contemplation. You know, we have a learning part of our brain and we have a doing part of our brain. We are so busy doing things that we fail to learn. And we are all equally guilty of it. You learn by reading, by attending seminars, but very importantly, by thinking about your own experiences. That's probably the best form of learning. Even that we don't get time to think. And therefore, I believe contemplation is a very, very important part of uh, uh, being humanly connected. I did an exercise once, which is to sit in the morning instead of meditating on Lord Vishnu or Narayana, I said, what about the conversation I had yesterday at home with my family or in the office with my colleagues? And what were the nuances in what they said? Because bosses don't tell you what exactly they feed, bosses and colleagues, even wives for that matter, you know. And all these cartoons that you see, these little video clips, where the wife is telling the husband it's very cold in this place because she pulls her shawl around her and the husband is insensitive to it. Uh, and she says, don't you, didn't you realize that I didn't like this food because I winced my face and you didn't notice my face. You know, those are the kind of things what I mean by contemplation. And you know something? I found it really difficult to remember the nuances. I remembered what was stated, but what was the song behind the words, I didn't register. And that's when it, I felt that I am hearing them, but not listening to them. This is a great deficiency. Now, I think I've covered uh, uh, enough of these stories. There's so much emphasis placed on strategy. I'm sorry, some of you must be strategy advisors. I'm not taking a shot at you. Uh, but I'm just sharing a little story, which, by the way, it's a true story. Everything I'm telling you is a true story. I think it was the first world war. And uh, a Hungarian lieutenant was given his first subcharge. You know, it's like an engineer joining and he's given a certain production floor or install joining and getting a certain part of Tamil Nadu to supervise. So it was very important for him to perform. He had in his uh, platoon or whatever it's called, I think about 14 or 16 people and he ruled twice his age. They were doing an exercise in the Swiss Alps and uh, it was about 5 o'clock in the evening, dusk was sitting in. And uh, one of his colleagues said, uh, you know, Lieutenant, why don't we go out and do a recce of tomorrow's track? Because it's nice and bright now and uh, we'll have an easier passage tomorrow. So he said, okay, fine. I stay here, you'll carry on. As luck would have it, and as happens in the mountain areas, the good weather lasted for an hour and a half. And then it was cold, Breeze and snow. All night it's snow. But that is not unusual. It happens in the mountain areas. And this lieutenant, Hungarian lieutenant, felt really, really bad. He said, I have failed as a leader. The first leadership lesson I was taught was that make sure your men are prepared for every contingency. Don't let your men go unprepared. And look what I've done. My first subcharge. I've allowed my men to go unprepared. Their haversacks are here. Their stuff is lying. He was feeling miserable that night. Next morning, somehow they all turned up and came back together. And he was, of course, delighted. And he said, hey, what happened there? And then they described how terrible the night was and how difficult it was, etc. Then he said, then what happened after that? How did you find your way back in this very tortuous Swiss Alps? <laughs> They said, well, Grigory here had a map in his pocket. So he put his hand into his jacket and pulled out this map. 
And using this map, we came back. And he said, wow, that's fantastic. Just show me the map. And the map was not of the Swiss Alps at all. It was of the Italian Pyrenees. So when we talk of strategy, you can, if you do the right things, you can do it with the wrong strategy. And that's where the people connectedness part becomes very important. So this is one question I've answered. The second question, let me see how the battery is doing so far. Has the electricity come? No, not yet. Okay. I will take maybe one more question and then open it up if I may for questions. Uh, second cluster of questions asked uh, in the market research was, how can MSMEs and large companies build trust and cooperate better? Now, the it's a very super question. Uh, and the need for trust is sitting all around us. We can see it. What's happening in this country and many other countries, United States, UK, uh, Poland, Hungary, Philippines, China, is the absence of the currency called trust. And so it doesn't need to be explained that trust is very important. Um, and I think MSMEs in particular with difficult times can work better with collaboration than with cooperation. Uh, collaboration and cooperation than with competition. I want to just tell you two little stories. Like all stories, it is very uh, uh, charming. And you may say, well, it's a nice story to listen to, but how does it matter to me? Uh, about 35 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, there was an accountant, uh, a person studying to be chartered accountant and another person who studying to be engineer. They had a summer internship. They came into Hindustan Diva. And uh, during their two month internship, they came to the conclusion that what they want, do not want to do is to join a Hindustan Diva. They, they wanted to be entrepreneurs. And uh, by the time they finished their internship and built a little network, they noticed that in certain kinds of products like personal products, you use a large number of ingredients in very, very small quantities each. It, you know, it's not that you put rice and wheat and it's all done. So you have a very large number of uh, fine organic chemicals in very small quantities. And for a large company like Hindustan Lever to keep track you could, the whole production line could stop if that one item didn't turn up. Like an automotive asset. So they said, why can't we be what an automotive ancillary is to an automotive company? And they came with a proposal to Hindustan Diva saying we will start up a little company and uh, we need your blessings. Very Indian style request. Company the leaders at that time said, uh, you have our blessings, but don't expect any preferential treatment. We can't pay you a higher price or something. You organize yourself. We'll give you know-how. We'll help you to build capability. If you want it. But you have to be competitive. To the credit of these guys, they got two more people. The four of them started the company. And they did a marvelous job. And... Uh, the production line rarely stopped. They were able to give a large number of very fine chemicals uh, just in time, etc., as required by the company. They earned their keep and they made a profit. Because in those days, uh, 40 years ago, there was no Tencent or Alibaba waiting to give you money. And uh, then you know what they did? They went public. Many MSMEs and I, uh, startups are incapable of going around an IPO. The acid test of whether you're running a good company is are you IPO worthy? And they went public. Now the company is called Galaxy Surfactants. It's now quoted in the stock exchange. So you can look at their whole profile if you wish to. They are probably not more than 35, 40 years old if my memory doesn't fail me. And they are worth a billion. But you'll never hear their name amongst the unicorns. You only hear of uh, Snapdeal and uh, Big Basket and all the other guys. We've got a wrong concept in our head of what is a startup, what is an MSAB. The muscles and the sinews of this country's economy is based on MSMEs and startups who are still, many of whom are still working in what we dismissively call old economy. 
And I don't think you should be dismissed. You should feel proud of what you are doing and contributing to industrialization in this country. You just have to think differently. And, you know, I might play good tennis. My father might approve of it. Uh, I may win the Mailapur Open Tennis Championship. But bloody hell, I have to go and play All India Hardcourt. And I have to then play Asian Championship. And I have to finally get to Wimbledon if I'm really going to be an international athlete. And to be IPO, if you're not IPO worthy, you don't count in any of these. You're the champion of the Mailapur Club <laughs> or Matunga Club. And that's neither here nor there. Now, the moment you turn an MSME, why aren't you thinking of an IPO? I mean, there's a time to do it. I'm not suggesting everybody go and do an IPO. The standards of disclosure, the standards of scrutiny that you receive will make you really healthy. So, I do think that I don't want to give the impression that it's good to wait 20 years to become a billion dollar company. I want to give you the example of an American company called Cruise Automation. Cruise Automation started, it's an auto ancillary, but he start, he's a technology guy. And uh, he started one and he sold it. He started a second one and he sold it. And then he got into this electric mobility stuff. And he was bought over by... Uh, now you had the elephant trying to dance with the beetle on the cockroach or whatever. And uh, I must say the credit of General Motors and to, uh, they learned to dance with each other. And GM launched the GM Cruise, which is a completely new technology-based uh, car. I've not kept track of whether it has done well, but I'm giving an example that uh, MSMEs tend to think of the large companies as being harsh, not paying their bills on time, uh, you know, harassing them for better pricing. And uh, the large company thinks of the MSME as a little jerk who's there, you know, just messing around with some small little item. It is this that has to change. Uh, and it will change when you earn the respect that you deserve. You get the respect that you deserve and you have to earn it both the large company and the small company. And I use the Galaxy Surfactants uh, and the Cruise Automation example to tell you how two people went about it. I think it's a very important part of the whole exercise. Uh, today, we have seen crises. You know, those who think that VUCA and COVID-19 are some new things. Just take the last 15 years, 20 years, since we are 2020. Start from 2000. In health, we've had the SARS crisis, we've had the AIDS crisis, uh, any, any viro virologist will tell you many others. We've had the financial markets crisis in Asian crisis in 1997, then you had the dot-com bust in 2000, and then we had the Lehman Brothers in 2000. These were big crises, huh? If you read the newspaper headlines at that time, <laughs> you think the world is coming to an end. So what India faced liberalization was a crisis in 1991. Today, this government is trying to liberalize agriculture and thinks that it is as important as what they did for industry in 1991. They may be right, they may be wrong. That's not the subject of our discussion. But it, it, liberalization caused a huge um, dissonance, if I may say so, bombing the Bombay Club. It, it really shook up everyone. And all of us who lived through it know about it. And I was invited recently to write a paper. Rakesh Mohan has edited a book uh, in which uh, various people have written about liberalization. Rakesh Mohan himself, Montek Singh, Aluwalia, Vijay Kelkar. And they're all macroeconomists, you know. They're looking at it from the big picture. And I said, what am I going to contribute? I'm not even an economist. But I can say I worked at the firm level. I was working at the coal face. For seven years, 1991 to 1998, I was in Unilever. From 1998 to the next so many years, I was in Tata. So I've seen it at the cold face. Can I write a cold face version of how Hindustan Labor responded and how Tata responded? Both were successful, but they responded in very different ways. And that's the point I'm trying to drive, that there is no single way to do it. But uh, you have to find your own way. That's why uh, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, Swami Vivekananda said that these things will keep happening. You must have three Ps. And I would say this, uh, I'm giving the credit to Swami Vivekananda because he's the guy who said it, but they apply very well. He didn't say it for business, by the way. 
He said the three P's are you need patience. He used the word dhirat and sayyam. But the word in English would be translated as patience. The second one, he said you must have purity. Purity of intent. Niti. And the third one is perseverance. Parishram, he used the word. You must have perseverance. If you can have patience, purity, and perseverance, then you can you will tie this crisis in the next crisis as well. But what happens is when your patience and your per parishram, perseverance is heavily tested, you give up on meeting. And that's uh, uh, the beginning of the problem. Which leads me to the third and the last question I want to address. Have we got time? Are we okay? Another 10 minutes before we can put it for questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if, I just, uh, if I just fade off, then you know that uh, I wasn't scared of the questions, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> the, sure. the yeah. fact that one phase of electricity is absent and something has failed. Sure. Uh, one of the market research questions that has been put to me, and with this, I think I would have covered more or less all the 10, 12 questions that have been put to me by Ambika. Uh, how do you deal with ethical issues when employees want to take shortcuts? If I've captured the question that has been put to me, that's the way. The answer lies in the question itself. Every boss thinks that the employee wants to take shortcuts. And every employee thinks the boss wants shortcuts taken. And there's never a dialogue on this. What's the right cut or the shortcut? Uh, there are bosses who want to take shortcuts, no doubt. And there are employees who want to take shortcuts. About that also there is no doubt. The simple question that has to be answered is, if you are the MSME chief or the writer or the managing director, does your organization really value values? Uh, and if so, do you walk those values? Do you really walk those values? None of us is perfect. Every one of us is an imperfect. I mean, if you talk to some of my colleagues who work with me, they'd say, Gopal is now giving a lecture on values. Uh, this is what happened in a particular some episode. We are all flawed people. Large companies, small companies, medium companies. But at the end of the day, it's the uh, tone from the top. I use the word tone from the top. Every single experience cannot necessarily... I think we may have uh, okay, some internet connectivity issues. Let's just. Ah, can you hear me? Yes, Hi. sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you now. Yeah. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Yeah. You may not be able to see me. Uh, uh, we can I, see you, I, sir. I, uh, the light is down, but we can still see you, sir. We can hear you very clearly. Yeah. I'm sir. Okay. Uh, Sir, you can switch yeah. off the video. Sir. Tone, tone, tone. Yeah. Yeah, now it's better? Yeah. Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly now, sir. Uh -huh. Yeah. Tone, tone from the top I was talking about. Yeah. And uh, we as leaders don't read how we are giving signals to our children at home and to our employees at work, inadvertently. You know, the stories are numerous, where children are watching, daddy tell mommy, oh, phone call I am say I am so bold in our Children are very smart. I can see my grandchildren now, and I've seen my children. Have I done it? Of course I've done it. Telling my wife or my secretary to say, tell him I'm not here. Uh, but, that's a tone from the top. It's something to be corrected. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that it's when you uh, change the tone from the top that uh, you start to worry about ethics. And then leaders tend to blame their employees. And I think uh, in my experience, it should be the other way now. Kara dena ya. So what do you think happened in Hathras? Do you think that DM or SP did it on his own? Or was it the tone from the top? 
and that's a matter of judgment none of us knows the facts but show me a dm or an sp who would go and conduct a 3 am <laughs> funeral without a tone from the top so uh, maybe i should stop there uh, while you can still hear me if you can't see me uh, and uh, if raj ram kumar if there are any questions from yourselves i yes, will try to answer them and if the battery runs out then i apologize sure sir thank you so much sir uh, uh, you covered all the questions not only whatever we had posed to you but also additional questions that had come in last couple of days uh, during while registering you covered them all very nicely sir uh, there are a few questions people have started posting on chat i also request others if they have questions to share or you know unmute themselves and ask uh, sir there's a question from mr m ramesh uh, from business line um, he is asking uh, can you please share why india inks investments in rnd are not that much uh, he he states uh, the investments in rnd are so pathetic he is asking the reason for that um, ramesh has a very good question and uh, i have a reply india inc doesn't consider rnd to be an investment india inc does not conduct a con, uh, consider branding and advertising as an investment the only word we understand by investment is capital goods investment so there is a lexicon problem because that's the way the socialism you remember those of you many of you look old enough uh, to remember this 30 years ago the headlines in the newspapers would be so and so to invest 2000 crores in a polyester factory so and so to invest 5000 crores with the modern machinery in a so and so factory and your own companies my company hindustan lever itc would say we are going to a backward area we investing 150 crores to set up a soap factory or a cigarette factory or whatever we have been raised on that diet that that's an investment now today the world has changed branding matters the tata brand is valued at 20 billion dollars it's valued so high that it will become a bone of contention between mystery and uh, ratan tata also or it could become uh, depending on how the valuation is to be done um, as a guy who spent all his life in branding and advertising the second thing i ask is about uh, the second comment i would like to make is about the question asked which is r and d uh, r and d is written off right we don't want to write it off so there are various schemes to promote r and d you can have so much right off per year accelerated depreciation etc we have not seen the need for it india inc is changing by the way i don't want to suggest it uh, the concept of technology is it <laughs> you know that the printing ink i mean we have uh, mr doble mr doble used to run the printing fact uh, printing business right uh, during your time in itc well paper paper packaging at the director level but uh, actually raj and all the uh, chandas they are the packaging guys oh. hardcore well, packaging uh, guys let me tell you because if you're a printing or a packaging guy you will understand do you know the history of the ball pen the ball pen got its first uh, patent patent oops got the first patent in uh, now can you think of a ball pen which requires an industrial patent <laughs> but the first ball pen commercially hello can you hear me yeah yeah yes sir we can hear you yeah the first commercial ball pen came to in 1938 so why was there 50 years gap between the first patent so it's like a child who grows up in a family and studies bsc msc phd when the british uh, royal air force uh, placed an order for ball pens now what is the problem with a ball pen why does it take so much time you need a perfectly round ball which will roll in a viscous ink of a certain viscosity as soon as it touches that viscosity it should pick up the ink but as soon as it touches the paper it should dry up because who wants a smudging ball pen right and it should not leak I mean, this is common sense. We know it, but we never applied our mind so much to ball pens. 
and this required a lot of r and d you know how many patents were involved in the ball pen 12 that i have noticed you take this roller suitcase that all of us none of us should step out without a roller suitcase right the first patent for a roller suitcase was given in 1890 but the roller suitcase started coming into full usage only in around 1985 why did it take 90 years for it to become mature because a lot of and we went into that now i like to tell these stories because people must understand are wo suitcase mein kya hai anybody can make it <coughs> wo ball pen mein kya hai <coughs> we have to change the concept of r&d fair and lovely is a controversial brand and i don't want to get into the controversy of fair and lovely but it came out of a it's a simple consumer product what is fair and lovely is nothing but a bunch of vitamins here it's a it's a pot of vitamins you put it on your skin and the vitamins prevent the melanin that is in your skin from spreading that's all but it requires biological science it requires toxicology it requires uh, skin science so got hope so many patents protecting it so i think uh, i like to tell these stories of uh, in response to the question about rnd for mr mahesh is that the right name uh, because uh, i think a business line should publicize the great technology behind very simple products so that the consciousness of rnd can increase and it play a role in that not by quoting my example but you can use all the research i mean you take a simple thing like soap where i finish with iit and uh There are more lives than the entire pharmaceutical industry. Do you realize this? Do you realize that the WHO has put this out and said that the soap industry has saved more lives than the entire pharmaceutical industry? Why? Because your hand, which you have to wash, is like mountains and ridges from a virus or micro point of view. You know, it's very uneven. and microbes and viruses can go and hide in this and so gets in there like a roman gladiator and beats the hell out of the bloody microbes and viruses and i wrote an article on that as well to say how simple things carry very complex technologies behind them so ball pen roller suitcase and so i shan't bore you to tears but i think i i hope i've given mr so food for thought definitely sir uh, so there's a question from mr padma kumar uh, who is an ex employee of hindustan unilever he says he grew up uh, with a, a very different understanding of the way distribution and infrastructure were given importance basically he said there was a lot of dependence and on distribution infrastructure and importance given to them uh, over the years he feels that the distribution activity is getting tremendously de emphasized with examples on e-commerce direct retail and even the recent food bill so his uh, his question is do you think this distribution as a business opportunity will die you know distribution has been rebranded as logistics now it's one of the most sexy industries ask mr dinesh of tvs he will tell you uh names change you know earlier it was called selling then somebody invented the word marketing then they invented the word branding then they said consumer insighting so the words keep changing they take another example people talk today about uh, uh what is that word called i forget uh where you go and find out what all the stakeholders want and then you try to program your uh, your product design according to what all the stakeholders want uh insights is it design it, thinking it, sir uh, sorry design thinking design thinking design right yeah yes yes design thinking and there are guys who walk around um, maybe rightly so as design thinking experts because there's a discipline in everything that you do uh but what is branding it's all about design thinking and that's a very important thing to remember nuances will come and change it is like bharatanatyam is not exactly what it was in rupuni devi arundel's time and the bharatanatyam that is performed today is different but essentially it is nritya and is based on natya shastra that part you cannot forget what's next 
there's a question from Dr. Alpa Parmar. Uh, a part of which I think you have already answered. So she says, uh, she asked, do you believe employee connect is not only the work of HR department, but it should be practiced by each department? And she's asking, uh, requesting you to clarify whether employee connect and employee engagement are different. Employee connect results in employee engagement. One is the cause, one is the effect. So that's the first thing. Uh, of the answer to the second part of the question. And my answer to the first part of the question is it is not the HR department's responsibility. Yeah. It is a leadership responsibility. It is like quality control. If you say it's a QC department, then you know what kind of a factory output you get. I mean, any guy sitting in this audience will doesn't require me to explain. These are all the leadership attributes and the people power, as I call it, this vaccine, uh, is the most underrated leadership attribute. Everybody writes about it. I also give a talk on it. <laughs> but, you know, we don't do it. So excellence, quality, uh, uh, approaches to the consumer, uh, call it design thinking, consumer insight. Uh, you know, I, when I was in Hindustan Liva, as a board member, I would get presentations on what is the consumer insight about what they want about uh, detergent or soap or whatever. But in Tata, they never got it. I had to go right down to ask people. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that I would certainly agree that Hindustan Lever is far more consumer friendly than uh, Tata. That's why Tata had to sell top to Hindustan Lever. <laughs> uh, but then Tata has many other great strengths and skills with in Hindustan, even if you wanted an increase in your advertising budget to 20 crores, it went through like a smooth shot, no problem. You wanted to buy another packaging machine for 2 crores, and boy, they'll put you through the ringers. <laughs> in Tata, it's the other way around. You wanted 20 crores to <laughs> increase a machine, they say, take it, guy, why are you wasting my time? You want 2 crores for advertising, they say, why do you want <laughs> Because the mindset is that this is evaporating in crores. Whereas in the other company, it not be wasteful. So it's a mind sense. Yeah. Ram, I have a question, sir. And HR uh, is in that sense. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. You know, this, all this talk about a uh, lot of shifting of manufacturing to India, new supply chain, quiet, is that. Why is that that actually not much happens? A lot of things happen, but not happen with that pace. Is that something can be changed, that, that situation can change quickly, and that Indian market can emerge as a better winner than some of the other uh, Asian markets like Vietnam or some of the other countries which are gaining more than us. Your thoughts? Well, I have a, only one thought. I don't mean to be cynical or negative, but the problem that needs to be solved is not being addressed. And, you know, it's like I get palpitations in my heart and pain. So you say it's a heart condition. Then I must take some uh, whatever... Uh, X-ray or uh, MRI and do something about that. But if I massage your foot on the ground, that ultimately these nerves are all linked and do good to your heart. India is a very unfriendly place to do business in. Every MSME knows it. Every large company knows it. You will not say it in a public forum because uh, you're scared it will be misunderstood. But unfortunately, that's the truth. And there's nobody dealing with it. And all this stuff about doing better in, uh, what is it called? Ease of doing business. I don't call it EODB, ease of doing business. I call it WODB, woes of doing business. It's a bloody pain to do business here. And every bureaucrat and minister who never run a factory will be talking about ease of doing business, but every guy who's ever touched a machine in his life will talk of woes of doing business. We are improving, but at a very slow pace. I don't know whether that's not very helpful to you. We all give suggestions that you do this, you do that, but, uh, and regrettably, I mean, there are 969 licenses uh, that you have to get before you can set up a unit. Somebody has done this study. I think it is the team D's. Uh, so, you have to learn to just live with it. It's like saying the population is very large. I'm not saying it, but I'm just saying that uh, uh, that's the reality. Sorry, Virinder, that's not very really helpful to you, but... Uh, no, it's not, because I'm also it? thinking like you. In fact, I keep, uh, I also write few articles, not as many you are, but in fact, I try and address these issues. The, 
the problem is that smaller states like even bangladesh have now started to attract attention and none of our states have taken leadership to change that situation forget the central government the smaller states like goa you know smaller states like sikkim they can probably do so this. so it's like saying why is uh, you know when i used to work in madras which is a long time ago uh, i could go from my office in lic building mount road to my house in alwar pet have lunch spend half an hour or 20 minutes with my wife and come back to office all within one hour mm-hmm. today you would reach alwar pet <laughs> in one hour <laughs> so that's the reality chennai yeah. is chennai and bombay is like that as well okay what else anything right. else so there's a question from mr arun kumar so he's asking uh, with the substantial skewness in capital allocation and market size of firms do you believe that the environment will permit the rise of msmes msmes except to service the few large companies controlling and consuming nearly 70% of the resources you know this is a very uh, macro and generic question and i believe the larger the big people grow the more you need of collaborative small people at the end of the day it's an industrial or information ecosystem if you look at all these uh, trillion dollar companies the apples and the microsofts and so on they have grown by acquiring 100 200 startups so if an msme wants to continue to be an msme for about 35 years and hand it over to his son uh, then there may be a problem maybe i'm not saying there will but if you see as msme as a part of a journey and you're not sure what the journey will how it will end it's like having a child at home that child can't be at home with daddy and mummy till the child is 70 so at some stage the child has to go out and earn that's what i call an ipo or it will sell out or it will become the big company and somebody else tata was a startup nestle was a startup hindustan lever was a startup infosys was a startup tcs was a startup at different points of time so we should not regard msmes as some sort of an affliction and we have to change that mindset i really think msmes are extremely important it's like saying can our society do without adolescents do you think all adolescents that adolescents will be taken away from childhood to go straight to adulthood i don't think so but if uh, adolescent wants to remain an adolescent all his life as many msmes do because the mindset is i'll get some goodies out of it that is a problem yeah uh, so there's a question from mr giridhar krishna uh, you obviously spoke about uh, you know how hookah is not a new thing and how uh, you know it's uh, every age goes through its own version of hookah uh, he's asking how do we keep and maintain the attitude of positivity uh, you know throughout periods of such volatility and uh, you know such uh, difficulties that come uh, i am going to be a bit philosophical in replying life is a long battle with occasional sunshine whereas we have conceived of life as largely sunshine once in a while there will be little monsoon curiosity is the mother of positivity people who stop being curious stop being positive because those who are not curious will say yaar ye to aisa hi hota hai aisa hi chalta hai and uh, i suppose uh, that's the beginning of the end so if you're curious and you see some of the look at uh, this year's nobel prize winner in physics he is 97 years of age he got the nobel prize for doing some work when he was 57 you may argue he got it late but you know what that guy does every morning he goes to the lab and you see many such people wonderful example the people who are young at heart i mean when your dreams for the future are less than your memories of the past then you become old that's my definition of age when your dreams for the future are less than your memories of the past 
As you get older, your memories of the past become dormant. When I used to be in ITC, when I used to be in Hindustan Lever, when I was in the ministry, I did this. Bullshit. Nobody's interested. Forget it. What can you do tomorrow? And you're not in Hindustan Lever. You're not in the ministry. You're not in ITC anymore. And have you got a dream for the future? So that, you know, when I was in the tea industry in Brookborn, uh, they have something called Polar Day. P O W L A R D. Anybody who's been in a. Uh, Polarding is a way of trimming trees so that their growth is uh, rejuvenated. You need polarding as you grow up in your career. Uh, sir, do you have time for a couple of more questions? or? Uh, or... I have time. Uh, maybe we'll just take one more and then we'll close it. Because sure, now the darkness all around me. <laughs> yeah, sure, sir. There, there's a question that Mr. SSK has asked repeatedly on chat. So he's saying he has his own version of three piece. So he says, post COVID, how will the equation people plus process plus practice equal to business performance change post COVID? Well, I think uh, I'm hoping that post COVID, people will give at least as much importance to people. Mm. Because process has, because through industrial engineering, engineering, accountancy, you know, process has got its place in life. Mm. What is the third P? Process? Uh, people, uh, process, and uh, six, practice. Practice. So process and practice have got great uh, uh, currency. They are sort of well done. It's the people part that is so today. If I pre COVID, if I act, I'm just giving, hazarding a market share. Uh, if I take leadership's time, it was 10 45 45. It should become maybe 40 uh, 30 30. I'll tell you one of the great insights that I got uh, when I did these six books with my fellow authors of SPJ. Uh, I personally sat in on the interviews of six leaders. Uh, Anil Nayak, uh, Deepak Parekh, Uday Kotar, Harsh Mariwala, um, uh, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, and, uh, uh, and Ramadurai, Kohli, Kohli Ramadurai. And I was able to, you know, the academics were coming from a, they had a framework and they wanted to ask certain questions and get their data. I was coming in, I've also been a CEO. I was talking to them, like I have walked down this road, what did you, I was really stunned. How much of the time of a CEO of that kind of company that I just described goes in people matters? The answers I got range from 25% to 40%. And to me, that showed where people power should be. And when I think back, I, I was very fortunate. I worked in Hindustan Lever and Tata's both wonderful companies. The amount of time we spent on people. You know, when I was younger, I used to be criticizing, saying we don't do enough on it. Because I thought it's an engineering process, everything can be done. But it's the time you talk about people and get to soak in what people are all about. But when I look at... Uh, I'm not again taking a shot at MSN, even large companies. They're, the fact that succession planning is such a big problem in even large companies tells you how much time is spent on people. So, my opinion, 10 plus 45 plus 45 should become at least 33 plus 33 plus 33. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for all the wonderful insights and for patiently answering uh, you know all the questions we had uh, uh, thank you so much for doing all of this despite facing a power failure situation in mumbai uh, and you know patiently answering our questions i'd like to invite mr raj shekran uh, for a vote of thanks before that i can ask can i ask a favor of you guys sure sir please if by taking our uh, uh, our uh, plates and uh, banging them we could take covid away can all of you send a small prayer to whichever God you pray to that we should get electricity quickly? <laughs> I don't want to spend that. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else I can ask for in return from you. <laughs> but please do that. We'll pray to Tata's for it. 
<laughs> I was just going to say that. No, it's Australian com- that it's you know Tata, huh? This is oh, is it? But that's what the yeah, media yeah. said. The media talks about believe? saying Tata's are responsible yeah. for the power. I know Mr. Mahesh from Business Line is here, but don't believe what the television <laughs> tells you. <laughs> you may believe Hindu Business Line or Hindu, but not the television. Anyway, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, being with us today. And big thanks to all the participants you know it was wonderful uh, very interesting and uh, looking forward uh, to you being with us again very soon we'll invite you sir thank you sir uh, okay. all the senior members of itc and all my good friends if you'd like to say a few words we'd be very happy uh, mr doble mr vaidyanath well raj thank you very much for inviting us in the first place um, and that was a very uh, very interesting engagement that uh, mr gopalakrishnan brought about with all of us a uh, lot of insights and uh, although it was primarily addressed at the msme sector but i personally thought there was a lot of learnings for all of us too yeah. thanks very much thanks very much thank you so much sir thank you thank you, thank you. Thank that you. is because of the good market research done by these blogs oh yeah th- thank you for the certificate sir <laughs> <laughs> ambika sir i think you also endorsed it <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. I know we didn't. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Raj.